Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to AJ111, and this is going to be part two of chapter five. So remember, we were on chapter five talking about probable cause and arrest, and we are now going to start the second half of the lecture, which is going to begin with reasonableness and arrest. So the Fourth Amendment as we have seen, requires that arrests be based on probable cause. So we know that and we've talked quite a bit about that. Now, an arrest must also be carried out in a reasonable fashion, so we know that. And throughout the rest of our lecture or discussion that we're gonna have uh, this morning, we're gonna, we're gonna touch on six different points regarding the reasonableness requirement. We're going to look at warrants. We're going to look at arrests and warrants. We're going to look at arrests in, arrest in the house or the home. We're going to take a quick peek of, uh, remember what the term we learned, emergency or exigent circumstance. And we're going to look at arrests and force. And then we're going to finish up with misdemeanors, uh, traffic citations, and just what we call general arrests. So let's go ahead and start off with probable cause, warrants, and the courts. But this all falls under the umbrella of reasonableness and arrests. So the Supreme Court has expressed a preference for all arrests, actually, to be based on warrants. Now, an arrest warrant is issued by a judge, a magistrate, or other judicial officials that are acting as a representative of the government and establishes that there is probable cause to arrest a particular person or persons. Now, first of all, why do you think that the courts prefer that all arrests be done by warrant. Why do you think that that would be something that they would actually think of? Well, let's talk about it for a minute. So why this preference for warrants? Well, to obtain a warrant, the police appear before a neutral and detached judge or magistrate and they are required to satisfy that there was probable cause to arrest so or or to obtain the warrant now in the case of aguilar versus texas the part of the decision part of the information said that the informed and deliberate determinations of magistrates empowered to issue warrants are to be preferred over the hurried actions of officers who happen to make arrests. So the thinking is that an arrest can be intrusive and demanding on police and that the liberties of citizens are better protected or even best protected when the police appear before a public official and are required to present evidence that there is probable cause to make an arrest. And that's part of what the Aguilar versus Texas case is all about. So, I mean, and hopefully that kind of makes sense. So there, the court is basically saying that you know, law enforcement has enough to worry about and they might be a little slanted on their own because they're going to think that everything they do is correct. But wouldn't it be better when we're dealing with this level of intrusiveness and what they would say demeaning experience, possibly taking away the, the liberty of citizens? And this would be better done if they presented their case before an official and have that detached or third party decide if there was enough information 
to warrant probable cause. And, and I think that kind of makes sense. But we know that that's not always possible, which is why we have some exceptions to the warrant requirement. But kind of moving on. The Fourth Amendment requires that no warrants be issued but upon probable cause. But again, there are several constitutional requirements for issuing a warrant. And let's take a look at some of those what we would call primary factors is what I would call them. The first then would be probable cause. So there, there must be a demonstration by the police that there is fair probability that a crime has been committed and that the person named in the warrant committed the crime. And that kind of makes sense. Next would be neutral officials. So probable cause, we know, must be established before a neutral and detached official magistrate judge who reviews the request. This is typically, again, a judge or a magistrate, although the Supreme Court approved the issuance of a misdemeanor warrant by a, a non-lawyer clerk who was part of the judicial branch of government. But nonetheless, it's, they're, they're really talking about that neutral and detached official. So neutral official. Next would be the warrant or the affidavit. And the warrant must specify with particularity, meaning like specificity, the name of the person to be arrested, the time and place of the offense, and the specific crime with which the individual is being charged. And this must be supported by the affidavit or a statement, if you will, which typically is sworn under oath by the police officer, who in this case would be called the affiant, who swears to the specific facts and circumstances set forth in the affidavit that constitute the probable cause upon which the warrant is based. So just like when you go up, if you were going to testify as a witness in course, you get up there and the clerk will say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? And you say, yes, I do, because you're swearing that in court. You still have to do the same thing if you were going to get a warrant. You have to swear under oath. And the reason for that is if you are being untruthful, that there are going to be penalties for that. Okay, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, and then finally, we have the judicial official. And this is where a judge or a magistrate determines whether there is probable cause to issue the warrant. Now, the warrant process is not an adversarial procedure like a court trial and usually just involves a police officer who presents the warrant and the affidavit to the magistrate or the judge. Now, Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure authorizes officers to phone or radio in a warrant request to a federal magistrate who is authorized to issue the warrant over the phone. And, and that happens even at local agencies. You can do a telephonic warrant. Um, so it doesn't always have to be in person, but there are going to need to be some, some follow-ups and some signatures. So with that being said, let's also understand that a defendant may challenge the legality of an arrest based on the con or the contention that the warrant was not based on probable cause or that other procedures were not followed in issuing the warrant. So here are some areas typically that we see for challenging a warrant. And the first would actually be probable cause. A warrant may be attacked or challenged on the grounds that it was not based on probable cause. And examples are the challenges to the warrants in let's say the Aguilar and Spinelli cases. Uh, second would be the affidavit. The warrant may be overturned on the grounds that the probable cause is based on a knowingly false statement by the affiant, meaning the person that's filing the warrant. And then finally, a procedural irregularity. 
So a warrant may be overturned based on what we would say would be improper procedures. Warrants must be issued by a judge, a magistrate, or in the case of minor misdemeanors, another qualified member of the judicial branch of government. And the U.S. Supreme Court has held that a warrant issued by a prosecutor or a police officer does not adequately protect the rights of an individual and is invalid. And the case that talks about that more is Coolidge versus New Hampshire. So what about then post-arrest challenges to warrant, warrantless arrests, meaning like afterwards? So let's, let, let's talk about the fact that probable cause required for a warrantless arrest must be the same for a warrant. So what happens after? So maybe you make the arrest. Is there a challenge that you can do post-arrest? Well, the probable cause required for a warrantless arrest must meet the same standard as the probable cause required for an arrest based on a warrant. And I have a couple cases there, but in the Gerstein versus Pew case, the Supreme Court held that a police officer's on-the-scene assessment of probable cause provides legal justification for the arrest of a person suspected of a crime. Now, once the suspect is in custody, the reasons that justify dispensing with the magistrate's neutral judgment of probable cause evaporate, basically, and at that point, the loss of or the Supreme Court ruled that the Fourth Amendment requires that the individual who is experiencing an extended loss of their liberty is entitled to a hearing to determine whether a reasonable person would believe that the suspect committed the crime. So basically, in the Gerstein hearing, it's basically kind of what they call a probable cause hearing. And defendants are entitled to that after they are arrested to determine whether or not there was in fact probable cause. And in the County of Riverside versus McLaughlin case, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the Fourth Amendment required that the Gerstein probable cause hearing, remember I told you that's kind of what the case was about, be conducted within 48 hours of an arrest. The hearing may be delayed only by emergency or other pressing circumstances. So the first case, again, the Gerstein versus Pew talks about um, if you're going to be held for an extended period of time, there needs to be some type of probable cause hearing. And that County of Riverside versus McLaughlin case, the Supreme Court held that that requirement of the Gerstein or the probable cause hearing must be conducted within 48 hours of an arrest. So you can look into those cases a little bit more, but that's typically the definition of those. And that's the post-arrest challenges to a warrantless arrest. So kind of continuing with that, despite the U.S. Supreme Court's preference, again, for warrants, remember that most arrests take place without a warrant. In United States versus Watson, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized that under some circumstances, warrants may actually slow down the enforcement of the law. And that's kind of, a, you know, kind of an interesting thing. In, in Watson, the court upheld the warrantless arrest by federal postal inspectors of Watson for possession of stolen credit cards based on an informant's tip. And here the inspectors relied on a federal statute that authorized postal inspectors to carry out a warrantless arrest for felonies. Now, in this case, Watson challenged the warrantless arrest um, and subsequent search that undercover or that under you know uncovered the credit cards as a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Now the Supreme Court held that the warrantless arrest in public of an individual's uh, based on probable cause that they have committed a felony is consistent with the historic practice 
of common law as well as with state statutes and therefore it was considered to be reasonable. So again, here, you know, that was a lot of information in that case, but this U.S. versus Watson case, the court recognized again that in some circumstances, getting a warrant might slow down what we're doing. And again, it talked about warrantless arrests in public of individuals based on probable cause that they have committed a felony is in fact consistent with the historic practice of common law as well as with state statutes and state constitution and warrantless arrest of individuals is permissible even when the officers could have obtained a warrant now it's always better we always teach law enforcement officers it's always better to get a warrant if you can but sometimes you can make that warrantless arrest of a person um, and it will be permissible even if you had time to go get an arrest warrant. So with that being said, um, what about misdemeanors? So um, let's talk a little bit about, about misdemeanors. The, the U.S. Supreme Court has held that a misdemeanor must be witnessed by the officer for a warrantless arrest to occur. Now, this is kind of an interesting case um, because there's a case called Atwater versus Lago Vista. And here the Supreme Court answered the question whether it is constitutionally permissible for the police to carry out a warrantless arrest for a misdemeanor. And, uh, you know, I mean, what about a DUI? So we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. But let's say that um, and yes, this is a picture of a couple of our police cars uh, where a drunk driver ended up running over the top of the vehicles. Um, but let's say, and I think I had a picture here. So let's say there's a, you roll up to a car, um, somebody calls in a, a vehicle that's up against a tree, the motor's running, kind of smoke coming out of the car, and you get there and there's nobody in the vehicle. And maybe there's some blood from somebody hitting their head on the windshield. Um, and you can smell alcohol in the car, but there's no driver. And as you drive maybe four or five blocks away, you find an individual staggering along the side of the road and you stop them and you ask for his name and it comes back to the same person that's registered to the vehicle that was crashed. Can you arrest the person for that misdemeanor drunk driving? Think about it, and we'll and we'll try to clear it up a little bit. But but in this case, again, in this Atwater versus Lago Vista, Justice David Souter, and you can look up the case, found that the common law and historic practice of the federal government in 50 states for two centuries established that an arrest for a misdemeanor may be carried out without a warrant only when the offense is committed in the officer's presence. Now, the requirement that a misdemeanor take place in an officer's presence has been interpreted to mean that the, the officer must actually perceive the commission of the misdemeanor with one of the five senses of sight, hearing, touch, taste, or smell, or the individual must admit to the crime to the officer. Now, the officer also must carry out the arrest as promptly as possible. So the in the present standard is strictly interpreted to require that the officer actually witness every element of the offense. Now, a California Court of Appeals held that an officer did not satisfy the in present standard when he did not actually see a juvenile ingesting paint fumes. The appellate court noted that the mere fact that the defendant in this case had paint on his face and an odor of paint had, um, had dropped the sock saturated with paint only shows that sometime in the past he had undoubtedly been sniffing. But at the time of the arrest, the sniffing was was not established. But another case, while the officer may have had reasonable cause to believe that the defendant had not violated that particular section of sniffing paint, uh, 
the officer did not have reasonable cause to believe that the misdemeanor took place in his presence. So Atwater establishes that the police may arrest an individual without a warrant for misdemeanors committed in an officer's presence. Interesting. Well, what about misdemeanors committed outside of an officer's presence? A number of lower appellate courts have questioned whether the Fourth Amendment requires warrants for arrest for misdemeanors committed outside of the pre outside of the officer's presence. And I'll finish up with this. Several state legislatures accordingly have authorized warrantless arrest for various misdemeanors, including domestic violence, which you may not have seen in your presence, shoplifting, drunk driving, and even violations of hunting and fishing regulations, things that you didn't see. So despite the fact that the officer may not have actually witnessed the offense, so there's a case called People versus Burton. So anyway, in summary, and kind of looking at some of that stuff, and there's a couple more photos as we kind of go through, talking about the drunk driving cases or the car crashed against the tree. Um, again, some courts have questioned whether the Fourth Amendment requires uh, warrants for arrests for misdemeanors committed outside the presence, and a lot of states have allowed or authorized warrantless arrests for various misdemeanors if you can tie them together. Like in the scenario that I gave you, if let's say the guy staggering had a, a big cut on his head and it matched the where the blood was found on the window and he was intoxicated, he was the registered owner of the car, and maybe he had the keys with him um, or, or what have you. So all of that, if you can put all that together, they'll, sometimes that will fly if that makes sense. So here's really quick kind of the legal equation for felony and misdemeanors. Basic. So for a felony arrest in public, really warrant not required. For a misdemeanor arrest, uh, warrant not required where the crime is committed in the officer's presence. Or remember, we've got a little bit of leeway on on the on some of those types of crimes like domestic violence or uh, DUI or shoplifting, um, etc. So, what about arrests in the home now? So we were talking about in public. Now let's move a little bit into something a little bit more specific, and we talk about um, somebody's house. So United States versus Watson, as you recall, held that an arrest warrant is not required to arrest a person for a felony in public. And in that case, Watson left open the question then whether a warrant was required for a person inside of their home. So this case here, Peyton versus New York, and I have a link for you to look at, answered that question. And it held that, one, absent consent or emergency circumstance, remember that word exigent, it's kind of hard to say, but I can use emergency, or two, an arrest warrant founded on probable cause is required to arrest an individual in their home and three, when there is reason to believe that the suspect is within. So those are the three little prongs there. So Peyton versus New York. And it's important to understand the Supreme Court really stressed that the unjustified physical entry into a person's home is the chief evil at which the Fourth Amendment is directed, and that the Fourth Amendment draws a firm line of protection at the entrance to an individual's house, and the requirement that arrests in the home must be based on an arrest warrant protects the person or the person's privacy in the home from searches that are not based on probable cause. And you may also be interested in learning whether an arrest warrant is required when arresting a person for felonies in some other scenarios or other areas, like in a doorway. So maybe the door is open, but they're standing in the doorway, or maybe in a, a common hallway. Or what about a hotel? Do you need a separate, like, warrant for that so what if they're like right in the door or they're in the hallway 
What about these different places? Well, let's go back and look at those three really quick. So what about a doorway? Well, a number of courts have held that a defendant who is arrested when he or she opens the door is arrested in his or her home and that a warrant is required. Now, other courts have ruled that so long as the police remain outside the dwelling when executing the arrest of an individual who is inside the home, the arrest occurs in public and an arrest warrant is not required. Now, courts differ on whether an individual who exits his or her residence in response to an order by law enforcement and who is then arrested is considered to have been arrested in the home without a warrant. So it, it can be kind of technical, right? If they open the door can you, and they're in the doorway, can you just reach in and yank them out? Or if you tell them, get out here, and they comply and they step outside, are they now in public? So you can see the issues here. So what about a common hallway? An arrest that is made in the hallway outside of a defendant's apartment does not require a warrant. And then finally, what about a hotel or a hotel room? An arrest warrant is required to apprehend a person in, an, in a hotel or motel room that he or she has rented. So when we talk about that Peyton versus New York case, Again, the Supreme Court held that if there is sufficient evidence of a person's participation in a felony to convince a judge that that person's arrest is justified, it is constitutionally reasonable to require the individual to open his or her doors to the officers of the law who are armed with an arrest warrant. So that's kind of, but it doesn't always read like that. So basically what they're saying is that that if an officer has a warrant, then people are supposed to comply and open the door, if you will. But that doesn't always happen. We, we know that that doesn't happen, right? And we'll talk about forcing our way into a home a little bit later. So um, with that being said, what about an emergency? So let's talk a little bit about an emergency. So just kind of referring back, in the prior case, Peyton versus New York, the Supreme Court held that arrests inside the home without an arrest warrant are presumptively unreasonable, absent what we're going to talk about right now, the exigent or emergency circumstances, or don't forget, consent. The court in the Peyton case did not really define or discuss the emergency circumstances, okay? And again, the when you talk about exigent circumstance, it, it, it's an urgent need to take action. And there's a case that we're going to talk about in a minute. In, it's Mincy versus Arizona. And it talks more about um, the emergency situations and how law enforcement can can use that. Now, again, the word exigent means an urgent need to take action. And there's another case called Warden versus Hay Hayden, uh, where the Fourth Amendment does not require police officers to delay in the course of their investigation if, okay, and that's why the if is kind of put in those parentheses, uh, to do so would gravely endanger their lives or the lives of others. So the Supreme Court, because of this case, has recognized various emergencies that qualify as these types of circumstances that will permit the police to go inside of a house without a warrant when they have probable cause to justify entry. So let's look at a couple of them. And I don't remember if I put them. Okay, so I did put them individually. So hot pursuit, public safety, destruction of evidence, and flight. And let's take a peek at each one. The first one, hot pursuit. Um, this is where the police are basically in pursuit of a suspect. And it doesn't necessarily mean by vehicle. It means by chasing. 
in the case United States versus um, Santa Ana, Santa Ana fled inside her house when the police attempted to arrest her for drug possession. Here, the police pursued her and executed a warrantless arrest within her home. And in this case, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the police were in what they call hot pursuit and that the narcotics would, would have been destroyed had the police not waited to obtain, or had they waited to obtain a warrant. So the court explained that a suspect may not defeat an arrest which has been set in motion in a public place by simply retreating to their house. And that's the United States versus Santa Ana case. And that's a 1976 case. So again, hot pursuit. Uh, the next would be public safety. The police believe that the public safety is endangered. In a case called Michigan versus Tyler, the U.S. Supreme Court approved of the warrantless entry to fight a fire. A, a burning building, and this was stated in the decision, a burning building clearly presents an emergency of sufficient proportion to render a warrantless entry reasonable. Indeed, it would defy reason to suppose that firemen must secure a warrant or consent before entering a burning structure to put out the blaze. And that was Michigan versus Tyler in 1978. Next would be destruction of evidence. A failure to act will result in the destruction of evidence. Um, in a case called Kerr versus California, police officers had probable cause to believe they observed Kerr purchase narcotics and that he was dealing drugs from his apartment. Now, fearing that Kerr was aware that they were following him, the officers hurried to his apartment, obtained the key from the landlord, seized narcotics, and subsequently arrested Kerr. Now, the Supreme Court in this case held that the suspects have no constitutional right to destroy or dispose of evidence and no basic constitutional guarantees are violated because an officer succeeds in getting to a place where he is entitled to be more quickly than he would have had he complied with the warrant process. So again, these are interesting cases. And remember, there's cases kind of on all sides of some of these issues. And the last one will be flight. So here, the suspect may flee jurisdiction. So federal officers, in this case, we'll talk about, entered a hotel room and arrested an individual by the name of Richard Sumter, a major drug trafficker who was supervising the delivery from California to Detroit of a significant quantity of narcotics. Now, here Sumter dropped his cell phone on the floor when federal agents came into his hotel room, and the phone line remained open during the arrest. The officers feared that the individual on the other end of the line had learned of the arrest and would either flee or destroy evidence. That's kind of interesting. So look at this though. As a consequence, the police immediately entered a nearby hotel room and arrested another individual, Charles Crayhorn, a drug courier who worked for Sumter. Now the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeal held that it was not unreasonable for officers to believe Sumter's companions who had not yet been arrested would have been alerted of the arrest through the open phone line and imminently would have destroyed the evidence or fled. So again, just a very, very interesting case. And there are several more, but we really don't have time to go through all of them. Let's really quick look at the legal equation for emergency circumstances. So you have the the exigent circumstance, that's a tough word to get out sometimes, uh, which is, you know, probable cause. And we talked about the four things, the hot pursuit, the public safety, destruction of evidence, the flight, or emergency assistance. So what about now, let's move on to using force in order to make an arrest. So there's a couple of big cases
when we talk about force, especially deadly force. Now, we have seen that the Fourth Amendment requires probable cause to make an arrest and requires that an arrest be carried out, remember from way at the beginning of the lecture, in, in reasonable fashion. Remember those words? So the U.S. Supreme Court has balanced the interest in individual privacy against the interest in enforcing the criminal law to determine when a warrant is required to, to an arrest a person. And the court has also employed a balancing test to determine, number one, when it is reasonable for the police to use physical force in making an arrest, and it does happen. And number two, exactly how much force is reasonable for the police to use under these circumstances. And we know that using force is an area of, of controversy, right? There are few areas as controversial as the employment of deadly force by law enforcement officers who are attempting to apprehend a fleeing suspect because this, in effect, imposes a fatal punishment without the opportunity of a trial when you kind of think about it this way. But remember who you're dealing with. Sometimes you're dealing with armed individuals that are willing to, um, you know, they use firearms and threaten people, and sometimes they actually kill people. So, again, there needs to be an opportunity for law enforcement to use discretion and to use force, but yet um, we, we know that this is controversial, okay? Um, and there are many reasons why. So... I'm trying to figure out the best. Okay, so this was the case, okay, when we talk about uh, the police, um, you know, um, imposing a fatal punishment without trial. Now, the police up until the 14th century possessed the right to employ deadly force against a person who the officer reasonably believed had committed a felony. And this was the case even in those circumstances in which a felon could have been apprehended without the use of deadly force. Now, the authorization of deadly force was based on the notion that felons were considered to be a lawless element who, whose lives could be taken in order to safeguard public safety. And this presumption was strengthened by the fact that felons were subject to capital punishment, meaning the death penalty, and to the forfeiture of property. Felons were considered to have forfeited their right to life, and the police were merely imposing the punishment that awaited offenders in any event anyway. Now, in contrast, only reasonable force be applied to apprehend what they call a misdemeanant. Misdemeanors were punishable or punished by a modest fine or brief imprisonment and were not considered to pose a threat to the community. As a consequence, it was considered inhumane for the police to employ deadly force against individuals responsible for minor violations of law. Now, while arming of law enforcement and the fleeing felon ruin, rule were reluctantly embraced by the American public, which, while distrustful of government power, uh, remained fearful of crime. Now, if we go all the way back to a case we're going to talk about in a minute, the common law fleeing felon rule authorized police to use deadly force to apprehend a felon who is fleeing from the police. And some state legislatures attempted to moderate the fleeing felon rule by adopting the standard that a police officer who reasonably, reasonably believed that deadly force was required to apprehend a suspect would be held criminally liable in the event um, he was shown to have been mistaken. Now, and that didn't make sense either. So the judiciary began to seriously reconsider the application of the fleeing felon rule back in, oh, about the 1980s. And only a small number of felonies remained punishable by death. And offenses 
in areas such as white collar crime pose no direct danger to the public. So with that being said, the fleeing felon rule kind of fell under this case that we're going to look at now, and it's the Tennessee versus Garner case. And this is where the officer who had probable cause to believe that the suspect posed a, a threat of serious physical harm, um, either to the officer or others, um, it is not constitutionally unreasonable to prevent escape by using deadly force. And we know that this has changed, okay, because the court in Garner balanced the intrusion on a suspect's privacy interest against the need for the seizure and held that probable cause to seize a suspect did not justify the employment of deadly force in every instance. Now, on the other hand, where the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a threat of serious physical harm either to the officer or others, again, it is not constitutionally unreasonable to prevent escape by using deadly force. Now, we may question whether it is fair to place the fate of a police officer who was charged with the unlawful employment of deadly force in the hands of a judge or jury who may not fully appreciate the pressures of confronting a police officer um, who is required to make those split second decisions. And on the other hand, some commentators argue that the law is ineffective in controlling the police use of deadly force because of the utilization of deadly force in many instances occurs in situations where there are few witnesses and that the judge and the jury typically must rely on the well-rehearsed testimony of the police. Uh, a question for you, do you think the standard established in Garner strikes a fair balance between the interests of the suspect and the interests of society in apprehending felons? So again, in Garner, um, there was a law on the books at the time that allowed the officers to shoot um, and use deadly force against fleeing felons. However, this case basically at the end kind of said that you, you, unless there's a, a serious threat of physical harm to the officer or others, you're not supposed to, you can't you employ deadly force. There's more you can read on this case on page 146 in your textbook. And remember, this was a 1985 case. And when we look at the legal equation very quickly, because we want to get through the rest of the lecture, we talk about using deadly force in an arrest, fleeing felon um, plus law enforcement officer and civilian acting under the officer's direction, plus no substantial risk of injury to innocent people, plus probable cause that felony involves use or threatened use of deadly force or substantial risk of death or serious injury to the police, plus substantial risk of death or serious injury to police or to the public. So you can see deadly force, there really, it, it needs to be this. Substantial risk of death or serious injury to police or to the public um, if the apprehension is delayed. Okay, so um, again, that's the Tennessee versus Garner case. And it basically talked about was the officer in the case justified in shooting and killing a burglar. Now, another very important case for uh, you to remember or think about would be Graham versus Connor. So what about the police use of non-deadly force? Well, and, and, and Graham versus Connor covered whether the use of force to seize an individual is objectively reasonable under the totality of circumstances. And again, here courts must consider the circumstances confronting the police at the time rather than analyzing the situation uh, with kind of 2020 hindsight. Um, hindsight. So here in Graham versus Connor, the Supreme Court held that claims of excessive non-deadly force as well as claims of excessive deadly force are to be analyzed under the Fourth Amendment reasonableness standard. The question 
is whether the use of force to seize a person is objectively reasonable under the totality of the circumstances. So just very quickly, in this case, police officer Connor observed Graham rushing out of a convenience store. Now, Graham later repeated that he was suffering from a diabetic reaction and was in need of orange juice in order to counteract the reaction. And he explained that he was deterred by the long line in the store from purchasing the orange juice. So that's why he hurriedly left the store um, and asked his friend to drive him to a friend's house. Now, the officers who were out front of the store grew suspicious and pulled Graham and Barry over for investigation. Now, Barry explained to the officer that Graham was suffering from a sugar reaction, and the police arriving at the scene were convinced that Graham was drunk and questioned whether he was suffering from a diabetic reaction at all. And the situation ended up escalating and culminated in four officers basically throwing Graham headfirst into the police car. Now, in this particular case, the Supreme Court held that cases in which the police are alleged to have employed non-deadly excessive force during an, uh, an arrest or an investigative stop or other seizure are to be analyzed under the Fourth Amendment objective reasonable standard. Remember, we talked about that. And the court stated that the question is whether the police officer's actions are serious or objectively reasonable in the light of the facts and circumstances. The relevant factors to be considered are the seriousness of the offense, the immediacy of the threat posed by the suspect, and whether the suspect, oh, resisted or attempted escape. So in evaluating the officer's response, the courts needed to consider the circumstances that were confronting the police at the time, rather than sit there and analyze the situation with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, meaning they already know the outcome. They had to put themselves in the officer's shoes for a moment. So, you know, the fact that an officer personally believes that non-deadly force is required to seize a suspect is not the determining factor. The question is whether the force is justified under that objective circumstance rule that confront the officer. So you can read more about the Graham versus Connor case. And I also put in here, just for your information, um, a couple of use of force charts. The first one is the reasonable officer response use of force, kind of like a hierarchy of use of force. And then another one from the Riverside County Sheriff's Department that talks about the different factors. So each of these factors play into this. This is the, it, we talked about it in your textbook. This is the objective reasonable test. Would an officer placed in your situation of similar training and experience believe the level of force was reasonable? And all of these are factors, officers, suspect, environment. So they're all different factors. So very quickly, again, misdemeanors, arrests, and citations, and we'll be done for today. We talked about the arrest versus citation. We talked about the Atwater versus city of Lago Vista. And part of this case um, talked about the, the fact that you can issue a citation for misdemeanors. Um, and and you, you, you can make an arrest and take them to jail, or you can cite them out. All right. So that was very quick. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood all of the different cases that Atwater versus Lago Vista, you can find on page 155 in your textbook. All right, so this is going to conclude the second half, our part two of our chapter five lecture on probable cause and arrest. Uh, don't forget to do the, uh, the, uh, uh, the key terms assessment exercise in your module. You can take that as many times as you want just to learn more about the key terms. And then also don't forget to review the uh, chapter questions, the review questions, uh, the questions for discussion at the end of your chapter. So again, that concludes the chapter five lecture and or part two.